Okay, so getting full user stack space traces. So user space stack traces um, <clears throat> could be used for profiling. So things like perf, let's make sure it's still there. Uh, perf, you know, when uh, you want to profile your uh, applications to see for how long to make nice flame graphs that, you know, Brendan Gregg always shows off, requires full stack traces. And that's something that's useful for things like perf. Um, F-Trace also uses it. Uh, so when you want to do like system calls, you want to know where the stack happens, you want to use uh, stack trace. <coughs> BPF can use it. In fact, I'm sure you could probably even add a filter to BPF to say, you know, trace things when a certain function within the stack trace is there. So lots of useful uh, applications. Now, acquiring the user space stack trace is where it gets interesting from doing it within the kernel. Right now, it requires frame pointers which means that you have to have frame pointers within the kernel to, or within the applications have to be built with frame pointers so that the kernel knows where the, uh, the next stack frame is. So when you go up to the user space where you entered the um, uh, current, or into the kernel, you have the registers, you can look at the stack, the frame, the, the, you know, the, the frame pointer, or actually the, the stack pointer to find out, you know, to find out where this frame pointer is, to find the next stack and everything. Um, when the frame pointers are not enabled, um, Perf, written by Yubi, uh, does like this huge copy of the stack and then post processes it later, I believe, using the dwarf unwinder to be able to find out where in the stack. So it just says every time you take like a profiling thing, it will like record what, like 16K of the stack into the ring buffer. So that could use quite a lot of data um, within the ring buffer. Um, <coughs> the problem with frame pointers is that it has overhead. And um, LWN had a nice article uh, when Fedora enabled uh, frame pointers. And I'll actually talk about more about that. But you know, frame pointers require setup of each function, um, which means there's more instructions to execute. Um, it also requires another register to keep track of the current frame pointer. So now you put more pressure on the registers that are used. And as I mentioned, there was a good LWN article that talks about this that gives, you know, it, when, they, when Fedora enabled frame pointers, uh, there was complaints that the build it, uh, increased by 2.4%, uh, the Blender test case increased by 2%, and there was even some Python programs that increased up to 10%. There, all from, uh, I don't know, I didn't do these tests, I just read LWN. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <coughs> How the stack frames work? Here's just a little idea. You have the stack pointer, and you have a, a frame pointer that points to the previous stack frame. And then from there, you could get, whoops, you could get where the next frame was, and then it'll show you where all the return addresses, and then you get a nice little uh, output. So um, inside the kernel, we have this thing called the orc unwinder, which um, means oops, rewind capability. But we all know they were just throwing that in because of dwarf and elf. So it's much simpler than the dwarf format, which uh, remember how, how many people had done like uh, assembly program inside the kernel where you had to put those CFI annotations all over the place and how many people got that wrong? Um, I was notorious with that. I did a lot of the assembly code and I tried in vain to get these things right and I would constantly get complaints from people saying, oh, this is totally broken. I, to me, it was just black magic. I had no idea how those CFI annotations worked within the kernel, it was just crazy. Um, in 4.14, uh, live kernel patching required um, <coughs> accurate stack traces. Reason being is there are certain cases where you don't want to patch the kernel if like that function is actually being used. You may not want to switch it. There could be race conditions that could add. So when live kernel patching would go in, it would kind of like do a, I believe it did like a stop machine or just something to check to make sure that and then it checked every single task and it had to do a stack unwind of all those tasks to make sure that it, what the functions were running was not something that was about to be patched and cause um, a crash in the kernel. Because the whole point of live kernel patching was to make sure that uh, the system could run and you could update the system without having to reboot. So if live kernel patching, patching crashed when you enabled it, that kind of defeats the purpose of the live kernel patching and people would be kind of upset at you. So, I remember when this came up and we, we were saying we need really accurate uh, stack traces. Uh, Josh, I'm not going to pronounce his last name because I know I will mispronounce it. It's French, starts with a P. Um, 
he uh, came up and developed the orc unwinder to solve this, which was uh, the tool, if you go into the tools obj tool, it does this and it actually can define uh, the orc unwind section um, at compile time. The way it does it is it has two tables. Uh, one table is the orc unwind, which is um, uh, the information about the frame point or basically where the return address is and a few other little things. And there's another table that just is the IP addresses that's arranged. And to explain this, how it works, is let's say you have your stack pointer that points someplace in memory with your return address and variables, and you have your instruction pointer someplace else you know, in the function. So you want to do a stack unwind. The Oracle winder, you look at the table for Oracle unwind, it's, it's a sort, the IP addresses are there, are sorted. It's um, basically a sort of like ranges. And so it's not every single IP address, basically it's the start of the function, end of the function. So you can easily find, the, with a binary search, the IP address. And once you find that, uh, the index of the Oracle unwind is equal to the, uh, the Oracle unwind IP table is equal to the Oracle unwind table as well. So for every entry, you just then go to, you, once you know where the index is, you then you can find the entry with more information on there. And one of the things is the stack pointer offset, which then you add, take this current stack pointer and you add the offset to it, it gives you the return address. That gives you the second instruction pointer. And now you start doing the whole thing over again. And this will tell you the sex, or the entry there, I got this a little bit backwards, but then you find the offset, or the stack pointer, I find the offset, gives you the second one to the next function and you get a nice little stack frame out of that. Which brings us to S frames. S frames is based off of ORC unwinding, same concept. But this time it's for user space. Um, what's nice about S frames is now you could do, when you compile with S frames, you actually could do from the kernel, if, it's, if this is implemented, uh, a full stack trace without enabling uh, frame pointers, which means we're sacrificing disk space for speed. We actually have none of the uh, performance penalties of frame pointers, but it requires more data to be stored to hold these tables. The section is in an L file, and it has the two tables. Uh, and so you have to, one of the things we have to require is to compile it in. Ideally, I would love to have this be like almost by default, or at least if you have the dash G option or something like that, that these are created. It would, uh, so basically, everyone will have this by default. But once we get this done, it will be possible to read this in the kernel. And that perf, ftrace, bpf can all benefit from this. So my idea for this solution, because the data that needs to be read is just located in a file, I have to be able to read it. And obviously, perf you know, triggers a lot of times from NMI context. So I'm thinking if we could do it from the, the ptrace path. Uh, we also have to find a way to handle the offsets because the raw, what it gives you is an IP address. Uh, and the problem with the IP address is the fact that it's relocatable. So yes, you get an address in virtual address space. Now how do we map that back down to something that I actually, you know, if I do a ftrace trace and I get a stack trace, a bunch of addresses, I want to actually point these addresses to actual functions or maybe at least file offsets that these came from. So then I actually could find out where in user space that these were. Otherwise, it's kind of useless for me. Um, one thing I'm saying, wouldn't it be nice, you know, we have this information already in the kernel, and that's if you, you just cat proc, you know, maps, and it gives you the nice address of where everything is mapped, files are mapped to the uh, uh, address spaces. So the way this would work would be, um, so you're in user space, NMI triggers, let's say. Jumps down to perf. Perf says, I want a um, stack trace. Currently, it just says, okay, I'm gonna read the, it actually does this from NMI context. It will actually read the stack from NMI context with a, um, you know, don't page fault option. So if you do take the option, it doesn't do anything. It just says, okay, you faulted. And in case if the stack just happens to not be in memory for some reason, memory pressure, and it was kind of swapped out into the swap disk space, or you hit a section there, too bad, you just, it, perf just will not even trace that patch. You just drop your thing and continue. I want to change this, and I've been talking to Deirdre about this, about, okay, instead of doing the full stack trace, it's going to ask for an S frame. And then um, on the way out, so it's, it returns some 
NMI context. So this could be from in the error context or any time. But just before we e exit back to user space, there's a flag that's set that could be set inside the task struct that says, is there work to do? And if it's not set, it just says, okay, no, go right back. It's in a fast path. We don't want this to do anything. Um, it's a very simple bit check and goes right to user space if there's no work to do. But if there is work to do, then we go to the ptrace path. The reason why it's called the ptrace path, and in fact, ptrace and pt regs and everything else we know is based off of all the ptrace code that GDB uses to trace other applications. So in this ptrace path, ftrace does stuff, perf does stuff. This is where all the tracing happens. What's great about the ptrace path also is that it's in uh, the normal context. We can sleep. We can map in pages. We could do whatever we want at this location. So we are guaranteed that we can get the pages back in if you know, we're, you know we have memory pressure or whatever. But we can actually get the full stack trace without losing it due to something not being mapped in. So then what perf would have, perf, ftrace, or bpf, or whatever, could have a way of register to the S, uh, S-frame infrastructure that says, OK, I'm going to get the, the, the stack trace for you and then send it off to perf so perf will get and record this uh, chain. This will require changes in the perf user space tool. Uh, the reason why is because um, you may want to do profiling of the user space as well, and you go into a system call that takes a long time, and you get, say, three or four hits with the NMI while you're inside the system call. Each of those hits is just going to do the kernel stack trace, but then it has to do some sort of flag or something that says we're going to add a user space stack on top of this. But it won't do it in this ring buffer. The ring buffer will actually just say stack with a flag or something that says I want a user space on top of this and keep going. Maybe it has to be a tag so we can identify it. And then on the way out, it will actually do the record. And on users, when it goes back to user space, user space will have to go back and say, oh, you know, we see these kernel stack traces without the user space stack, but there's going to be a flag or something saying we want one, so it's going to actually have to keep going. It says there's one coming up, and we'll just have to store that information until it finds it, and then it could reappend the um, user space stack trace. Yes? Is there a Mike? Yes, Steve, I, I was uh, wondering to uh, kind of make perf work out of the box. Is it possible to reserve some space um, below the kernel stack? OK, actually, this is um, a second benefit from this process. Smaller, smaller perf. Why user. are we wasting um, this space on the ring buffer when it's just duplicated? Yeah. You know, once you're in the kernel, the user space stack is not going to change. You could wait to whenever you want to do it. So the idea is. It actually has two folds. One, to fix it so we could make sure we guarantee to get it. And two, let's save the space or you know, ring buffer. Ring buffer space is um, you know, high real estate. It costs a lot of money to, yeah. to use that. So then it's done. It goes back to user space. So the other thing I have is relocational addresses. And this is, oh, uh, yes, I, yes. I, yeah, I have a very quick question about uh, stack that's been swapped. Um, so. Like, do we want to know that that st stack was swapped at the moment when it was actually um, uh, profiled? Um, I don't. I don't care about it. I don't know. I don't think Perf wants to know if the stack was swapped out. We might. We have trace events that could tell us about it. But if it's swapped out and we actually have to map it back in, it's going to actually. Yes, it may happen. And yeah, and that's well, actually, actually that's another issue that we have to think about with this whole thing. When we get to this location, and, and, um, and I might want to talk about this. This is kind of like some of the things I should probably want to talk about right here. The work I want to do is much more likely to require um, memory paging in at this point. Where the old point, we're just looking at the stack, copying the full stack. It's highly like, unlikely that the stack is swapped out because the stack is used a lot. So in the LIRU algorithms, it's going to be always the most recent, least re recently used, whatever. So the idea here is this. When <coughs> we ask for the stack and we go into the, per, per, the, P tr uh, the ptrace path, and this is where I'm going to need input and discussion and maybe um, discuss it here, offline, and if someone wants to please email me that would like to be involved in this. We are going to now do that lookup of like the orc unwind lookup. The problem here is that table is a elf section. So 
there's a few things about this. Now, we talked about just get user pages. You know what? Honestly, what I would love to have is that the S frame section is a loadable address. And this is where I don't know how it works. In user space, from what I understand, when you execute something, it will just say, OK, here's where everything's mapped, but it doesn't update the page tables. When you go to execute and the page table doesn't exist, you take a page full. Goes into the kernel, the kernel looks at the VMA and says, hey, you know, this is code from this file. Goes, finds the file, maps it in and into that location, and then goes back to user space and it just keeps going on until it falls off the page and then, you know, does it again. Maybe you have optimizations to pull in more than just one page, who knows. The idea here is I want the same feature with S frame. So the S frame will not be mapped until it's used. So we come into this point. Now, yes, it will cause that Heisenberg effect where the tracing will slow down the application. The thing is, once it's mapped in, it's seldom likely to be mapped out. So it will only have an initial hit. And yes, if you're doing profiling, you might see a little blurb and then maybe we could write some code to say just let it go for f like a little bit and then everything else. I, I mean, it just sounds like it's such a rare event that the uh, stack gets swapped out that we this, probably But that's not, that's not what we're having to worry about, though. Uh, that, that we probably want to know about that. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, n no, don't fault it, just like keep it swapped out. That, that, I mean, that's fine. Right. Like, let's, let's take a, uh, a, s a, s a slow... Uh, uh, trace event and um, uh, but but get the stack. But uh, I'm just saying that like we should we should keep this information to the users so that like the, so they know so that this stack. So this happened. We could moment. do that. Okay. Yeah. You know what? That's actually a good. That's a good point. That's actually something we could add into the infrastructure. We could add into the perf infrastructure or whatnot. Saying that if we do take a page fault, that we record it and time it, and then actually send that information up to perf, and the user space can then say, oh, this little blurb here is due to our, our tracing and try to fix it. So that actually is a very good point. John, please mark that down, because I'm not going to remember it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's recorded, uh, uh, right? Team, what, what, what are you just talking Is this going to get rid of that awful patch to add build IDs to every struct file? So the build ID, oh, wait. There was, there was a patch that wanted to add build ID to every wow. single struct file. Please, please, please tell me what you're working on. We'll get rid of that. Well, that's a struct file for, or what struct file? I don't even know. Like every, I, every single struct file. They wanted to add a pointer to store a build ID in. Yeah, I saw that. I, didn't, I, never, got, I never understood the purpose of it. And I don't know if this was is. Was it by Google? Um, was, it was it the. It was uh, Jerry, Jerry Olsa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, would you would you want to pass the mic over? Do you want to re respond to that? Uh, yeah, no, I sure. <laughs> uh, sure, so yeah, I guess the reason for the build ID in the file object might be for bigger discussion. I guess we covered it in uh, in the demo uh, discussion. I'm not sure if this could be actually, uh, this could help with that in some way. Uh, the problem is that we, we would like to have the build ID information like uh, available in the context where it's really hard to get. Like in NMI, uh, we can try to read it, but it's not reliable. So the reason for that was that we try to uh, read it at, uh, at the memory, uh, at the page loading time, uh, VMA loading time, and store it in the file where we can access it later. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where this is going for uh, this table, if that information will be available then at some point. Uh, the point with the build ID, we would like to have it like prepared so we can actually have it available in the context where it's really hard to get. So, was this build ID for, for something to do with um, what mapping, like knowing which? So, build ID is like this uh, unique ID uh, of the application. So later on, uh, you can actually identify like uh, debug info uh, directly for that application that you are running. Okay, yeah, so Mike wants to. Can someone please give Mike the mic? Uh, so, if Steve builds this infrastructure to the go to the P-trace bus, you can access the build ID from there, right? 
it's not an NMI context, it's normal kernel context and you can do pretty much whatever you'd like to. Yep. So, okay, do you want to continue this conversation or do you want me to continue with this S frame? Yeah, 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 okay, I'll go with the S frame. So, um, oh, so what my dream thing for this point right here is that the S frame, which is a section in ELF, is treated almost like normal text sections and data sections that are in the file so that I don't know if in the current, how the kernel would work. Is there, how is that done in kernel? I know there's get user pages, but if I want to simulate a, like this is actually an execution that actually maps in and I could actually do something like user space where I, this code I'm going to touch and I want to map I, it I, in. I think you're making this too complicated. I, I, I think all, all you really want, you, you don't necessarily need to use get user pages, right? You, you just want to access some bytes which are in a file somewhere. Yes. Right? So you, you can you can just go to the, you, you can ask the page cache, please read these bytes for me, and it will do that. Okay. And it never gets mapped into user space at all. We don't, we don't play with the, the page tables. You can just get those bytes out of the page cache. Okay, so that's actually pretty good, and it, and, but it's going to have some tricks that's coming up. Too. Okay. But no, actually, this is the thing. I might actually actually ping you about more information about oh, I'm this. I'm more than happy to help you with this. Thank you, because that's the whole idea. Is like I want, I have to do that binary search in a file that could be huge. I mean, this will be. We're going. I plan on having Chrome built with this, yeah. and that's going to be a several meg S frame section that's going to have to do a binary search to find things uh, for these lookup tables, and it's it's going to be sparse. It's not going to pull in everything. So I don't want the full page locked in. By the way, um, Indu did do, oh, she's the one that, by the way, I just want to let you know why she's up here. She implemented the S-frame logic on the GCC side, so, um, and Binutils. So she's completed that. I was so excited to see it. I've already compiled, and she's done it. Um, and she even has a proof of concept on the kernel side. Um, so that's, that's, so she sent out that, and it does things, but um, it's just to see if it works. That's all it did. She designed the format too. Yes. Oh, and she designed the format of the S frame file too. So uh, that's she's done a lot. So appreciate it. So it's not going to replace object tool for the kernel. Well, it's not going to replace object tool. Object tool. Well, actually, you know, technically we could make S the kernel use it. That's that's actually something we could instead of having object tool do it. We could actually since it's a big build thing, if the compiler is already making S frame, then not. Yeah. So I think the kernel has these. Um, two things which will be problem, inline assembly and handwritten assembly. So you ha even if, so good thing is that if you do write CFIs correctly for these stubs, then you will have correct S-frame information generated for it. But as far as I understand, there are non-standard stack usages in these, in, so, so if there is non-standard stack usage in the sense that um, there is a specific register that you're using to say that this is where my stack is stack pointers are going to be stashed. That's not something that S frame can represent. It has to be so S frame doesn't say that I identify the stack pointer register for you. Across ABIs, it just says the unwinder will find out whatever that ABI is, the unwinder knows what that stack pointer is. So cutting it all short, no, for um, kernel space, we'll have to see whether unwinding through these um, portions of the kernel where you're using non-standard, where, you, where you're using the stack in a non-standard way, is it very important? If not, then yes, it could be used. If it is important, then it will not be able to cover those parts in the form it is. And I think it will be harder to even, even if we go that route that if we do want to support it in S frame, I think it will bloat up the format. But again, we can talk more depending on how important that part of the it could maybe simplify Optool. So we could actually build the best frame and then Optool could just look at the S frames instead of having to do, do its own analysis. So from where it is used, Optool could actually say, hey, I have S frame, I'll just use this data and create my tables with that. So, and then throw it out because we don't need to keep it. Um, so yes, I need uh, to have that so we could do the quick search. Uh, question? Or is this question, yes. Oh, I, yeah, so Steve, I was just thinking like, I, I like uh, Matthew's uh, idea of uh, the, uh, you know, the calling the address sp uh, space operations, if I understand page, page cache. Uh, another like plan B, uh, if we don't want to complicate the ptrace path could be on the first NMI, uh, 
get uh, obviously you're getting the kernel stack, but you you need the user. So you can you could store in the perf ring buffer itself that you need uh, you know you need information about this file, and then in perf you could you could have perf call back into the kernel and load the s frame. How's that going to help f trace? Oh yeah, f trace. Yeah, I, I thought I thought you were dealing with perf and. No, make. actually, I, I, I know. F trace, PPF, anyone else use it? No, this is something that. But you uh, could make trace command. Yeah, but no, but do how that. does Echo and Cat do that? Never. Yeah, BusyBox is going to. Yes, never. <laughs> this is going to work for BusyBox, yes. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, you said that there could be megabytes and you are doing a binary search. So if, <laughs> if we did that by calls to some page cache API, it wouldn't be that much slower than if you could just go through the page tables? Oh, it, it should be a lot quicker. And um, the, the, the advantage of, of doing it by calling into, into the page cache is that you can control directly, is you can control the page cache and you can say, hey, please do read ahead for these things. So you could actually submit not just one IO, but you know, you, you could, if, if you're doing a, a binary search, you could say, I'm gonna want these three pages, please start IO on all three of them and you know, basically, you're, you're prefetching a level ahead of where you want to go. So the, 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 there's lots of interesting options once you're playing some those kinds of games. Okay, and, and since we got the five minute thing, I try to go a little bit. Some of, some of the there's a lot of things here. This is the first thing. If we get this in, this is great. But there's then we have this issue, the um, file offset issue. So in the file, so where main is, and this is actually real numbers. I actually did a little program and ran it. Um, you know, I do a file offset in the text file or whatever. It says, you know, text file offset or whatever in the, in the section is 1139. And uh, the main actually printed the address of main. So I just ran it and printed it, and I got that memory offset from there. Of course, you know, it's one of those things if you have the, you know, relocatable every time. So I, I ran this every time, and it got a different number every single time. The 139 stayed the same, but everything else changed. I want... This is the one that that crazy the the crazy number uh, here is going to be what is going to be in that stack trace. How do I convert that to main? You you subtract it from the you subtract the VM VMA VM offset from it and and you, you get the answer you want. Oh, do you? Uh, yeah, I, I I can get you that. That's okay. Line, so it's like code. from this. Yes. Or I have that. I I I can do that for you. Awesome. That actually great. So, um, I don't know if you want to go over this at all. Yeah, I had these two quick comments. I think the second one can be left out in the interest of time. The first one is that this format is unaligned on disk. And I know Kernel has a very specific thing around unaligned accesses. So, there are three main components to the S frame section there is S frame header, function descriptor entries, and frame row entries. Oh, we flipped to the next slide. Uh, yeah, so. Going back, you know, S frame header, there is no problem because these uh, the members of this structure are naturally aligned, and uh, the function descriptor entries are 17 bytes. So, so you start off in the memory, and at some point, these will be unaligned accesses. All these accesses can be managed. I mean, you could write the API so that you know that if you are doing unaligned access, you go byte, and then you could still read four when they are naturally aligned, and so on. So, it is possible to do it. You know, in a in these APIs, but I did want to point out that this will be done something like this. You will have mem copies and weird looking casts and stuff, but uh, so, and the, because there is no other alternative, if you go to the route that this has to be aligned, I think it will bloat up the format because we really try to do many compactness related optimizations that if it is just a number like 16 that I have to encode, I'll use only one byte in the format. So it is, it is natural for this format, and it is best. In a, it is in the best interest of this format to be unaligned. So I think it should remain like that. And we we plan to handle all of this in the, you know, APIs that we have. That's it, I think. Yeah, and that that I think we can handle. She just wanted to make sure we pointed that out and let me know that. Here's some little things that we have to look out in the future, but by time. But this is like I said, if I could just get this part in, that'd be awesome. Uh, but we need a way of handle DL open. Um, that is, we're not going to have a file. We may have to have a system call to say that here's the S frame for this file, you know, to tell us that. JIT, how do we handle JIT? So that's going to be very interesting because that's we have to find a way of saying kind of like here's an S frame for this logic that has no file back, <laughs> backing stuff. 
Um, one thing I'd like saying is like, is there, you know, maybe passing the file names into the trace buffer, but I don't think you guys really care too much about that. But here's another thing is, could we actually get the symbol names somehow? So if the, we have the symbol L file, or if we could do some sort of logic to say, hey, I got this address, can I actually look up in the symbol team, or I don't know if it's dwarf or something, or if we could have another uh, extension to S frame or something, maybe this is on your side that we could say, here, by the way, here's also this, the functions, not, not only is that the, uh, yes, someone's, okay. So if I understand correctly, you already have to parse like the L format to even identify the section in the file and then do the binary search. So you already have to identify the section somehow. So that's, you could identify the other ones, right? Well, yeah, but that's, well, yeah, that's done already at the loading of the L file. The, the, so bin elf uh, parses it. So we could just have to add the S frame. That's another thing I would say. We need to ha actually add the code in the bin Function or something right now automatically. Yes. Uh, Could be the map info of DLibC. So basically, DLibC will will uh, will load the shared object or whatever, and then DLibC internally it keeps uh, it has a linked list of uh, map descriptions. So what you need is the kernel to have access to the map. Yeah, info. yeah, that's too. Yes. So but you but don't we have to parse the But we have to define a form, like, I mean, this is something that the kernel in the uh, in glibc does not have any defined specification. So there has to be a specification that we could follow that way we don't break user space. Uh, one thing I think I don't think you mentioned or any that S-Frame actually implemented is a versioning. So we could actually, actually if we want to add to it, we could actually increase like the version of S-Frame and you know let the kernel know like, oh, this is a different version so we could actually can change the S-Frame format if we need to in the future. So that's basically, I think I covered pretty much everything. Any other questions? And uh, yes, uh, Matthew, I'm hope looking forward to working with you because uh, we really, yeah. really want this in, yes. I actually, <coughs> talking about the map info and everything, uh, the S-frame information, it lives in its own segment. And this segment is uh, typically in a shared object, right, in a library. Is, is that a problem that is shared among, you know, the Actually, it's, be it's better, right, yeah. I guess, yeah. As long as there's broadly definite parameters. <laughs> if, it's if, if, if the loader has discarded it, I mean, I, I, I can't work magic. I can't bring it back with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm looking forward. Hopefully, anyone wants to help out, we're going to try to like, keep track. And uh, this is why it's here. So thank you very much um, for your uh, time and listening. And thank you. And also, thank you, Indu. <laughs> <laughs>